The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up. It grew, like, violently. A cancer diagnosis for a mom eight months pregnant. This is it. I thought I'm going to die. Watch a miracle unfold. We have to deliver him in order to treat you. And see the prayers that saved two lives. I could literally feel God hugging me. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to this edition of the 700 Club. The Justice Department Inspector General's report is due any day now, and there's some report from the early uh, findings that it may be alleging criminal behavior in the Justice Department in relation to uh, Hillary Clinton's emails. And now Trump is saying it looks like the FBI had a spy in his campaign and is, quote, worse than Watergate. It's a lot of mess. Well, the president is also taking his first extensive comments about the status of next month's summit with North Korea. And he seems to be suggesting that the Chinese, the Chinese are playing a role behind the scene. Hmm. The president also mentioned the possibility of economic assistance if Kim Jong-un gives up nuclear weapons and says that the U.S. won't pursue regime change as part of the negotiations. CBN's national security correspondent Eric Rosales takes a closer look. President Donald Trump has made it clear North Korea must denuclearize or it's no deal and no talk. Despite a North Korean leader saying that the summit is in jeopardy, staff here at the White House say that they are planning as if the summit is a go. The North Koreans have an infinitely rich propaganda playbook. They've deployed it over the years in, in many different ways. I think the president's made it clear he's prepared to meet them in Singapore on June the 12th and see what we're uh, able to agree on. If uh, they don't want to come, he's prepared to accept that too. So what led to the sudden change in direction? President Trump believes it might be due to one-on-one -on -one meetings with Kim and China's President Xi. I have a feeling, however, that for various reasons, maybe including trade, because they've never had this problem before, China has never had this problem with us, it could very well be that uh, he's influencing Kim Jong-un. We'll see what happens. In an interview with CBN's David Brody and Jenna Browder, former President Jimmy Carter said President Trump needs to stand strong. And I think they're willing to give up their nuclear program completely if we will reach out to them halfway. President Carter, what would be your advice to President Trump going into this meeting? Uh, treat them with respect. Don't have any prerequisite on what they should agree to do and be willing to uh, accommodate their basic request. Analysts see China as a puppet master and could be telling Kim to not give up so much. And I'm worried that the Chinese are going to start to undermine those sanctions, which will really release the leverage before we even had these discussions. You have to want to do it. With deals, that's what I do, is deals. And with deals, uh, you have to have two parties that want to do it. President Trump said he is ready to negotiate a deal. Eric Rosales, CBN News, Washington. Well, you can see more of David Brody and Jenna Brower's interview with former President Jimmy Carter on CBNNews.com. Well, in other news, President Trump says reports that an FBI informant spied on his campaign could be, quote, bigger than Watergate. John Jessup has more on that story. That's right, Pat. President Trump and his allies in Congress want answers after new reports an FBI informant spied on his 2016 election campaign. The Washington Post reports the source passed on information about connections between Trump and Russia that eventually led to a broader investigation by the Justice Department. In a tweet, the president described it as bigger than Watergate, if true. Trump attorney Rudy Giuliani told the Post the confirmation of any such informant would make the Mueller investigation completely illegitimate. He also said the president thinks the Justice Department should release classified documents that would reveal any illegal surveillance. Pat, back to you. You know, there's some thought that when this Inspector General report comes out, it's going to put the finger on some of these key figures in the FBI and that the Mueller investigation is actually to try to divert attention away from what the uh, 
allegations in that inspector general's report are. I think the FBI is dirty on this one, really all the way up and down the line. And they are going to be terribly embarrassed when the truth comes out. They're stonewalling a congressional request for information. They're acting in a shocking fashion as far as I'm concerned. And the thing is that the FBI is supposed to report to the Justice Department, which in turn is supposed to report to the president. And the fact that an agency of the, of the administration is stonewalling the Congress to try to keep them away from finding out facts of, uh, against them. And there's a real possibility that this Mueller investigation is actually a smokescreen to divert attention. But as Rudy Giuliani says, if indeed they had a spy in their campaign before that uh, whole thing came out, it makes the investigation totally illegitimate. John. Pat, the Trump administration is moving to deny taxpayer dollars to clinics such as those run by Planned Parenthood that provide abortion as part of its family planning services. It's also dropping a legal requirement that clinics must provide information and referrals on abortion in their counseling services. The Department of Health and Human Services is expected to announce the new proposal today. Around $260 million in federal funds go towards family planning through the Title X program. Pro-life groups say the program indirectly subsidizes Planned Parenthood, the world's largest abortion provider, even though it's illegal to use the money to pay for abortions. Vice President Mike Pence has come under fire, uh, under fire from the media, questioning his loyalty to President Trump. In fact, recent reports go as far as claiming Pence has a covert agenda separate from the president. CBN's Jenna Browder has more on what seems like a coordinated attack on the vice president. Our president is a believer. He loves his family and he loves this country with an unshakable faith in God. President Trump and Vice President Pence. He and Karen are doing an unbelievable job for our nation. Thank you, Mike. Side by side, pushing forward their conservative agenda. I couldn't be more honored to serve shoulder to shoulder with the most pro-life president in my lifetime. But multiple new reports suggest Pence has an agenda of his own. The New York Times, Pence is trying to control Republican politics. Vanity Fair, insiders see a shadow campaign taking shape. And Politico, Trump puts Pence in corner. The coverage appears coordinated given the timing. So I think this is more about leaking from people who are trying to score some cheap political points than there's actually any truth to any of it. Mark Lauder, former special assistant to the president and press secretary to the vice president, calls all of the headlines the nonsense. President, the one thing I would tell you, and I've been affiliated with the campaign and the White House for nearly two years now, is that there is no greater champion of the president than the vice president. And there's also no daylight between them. They know exactly what each other is doing pretty much at all times. Conservative columnist George Will sees something odd about the Trump-Pence relationship and in the Washington Post wrote that Pence is selling out his conservative values to please the president. The, the title, the headline, Trump is no longer the worst person in government. What do you make of it? It's, it's sad and, and unfortunate. Lauder says it's also untrue. To use a, a comparison that I know would mean something probably to George Will because he is a noted historian and writer on uh, our national pastime of baseball. But the best players in the game miss seven out of ten times. And in this case, I think he uh, swung at a pitch at a, in the dirt and struck out. Lauder points to the hiring of former Trump campaign manager Corey Lewandowski as proof the president and vice president are on the same team. Lewandowski told CBN News, It is an honor to join the Great American Committee, the VP's PAC. I look forward to working with the president and vice president's team to help Republicans increase their majorities in both the House and Senate. The vice president's office is also defending his active role in the overall political operation. Press Secretary Alyssa Farah gave this statement to CBN News that reads in part, The vice president's political and fundraising travel advances the president's agenda by aiding targeted candidates and committees during the midterms, which is what the president asked us to do. Mike loves his brother, who won by a very big margin. 
With the midterm six months away, Lauder jokes the real rivalry is between the vice president and his brother, who's running in Indiana's sixth district. Oh, they absolutely are. They're brothers. They, they have a brotherly rivalry, and Greg Pence will be the first one because many people often say that he looks like the vice president. He will remind you that, the, that he is older, so the vice president looks like him. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Pat, if anyone has an inside perspective on the relationship between the president and vice president, it would be Mark Lauder. Well, there's no question about it. I, I tell you what, uh, uh, Mike Pence is, is a dedicated Christian, very honorable, and a strong conservative, and he is as loyal to the president as anybody I have ever seen. There is no question. This is the fake news. They have to get it all the time. And, you know, uh, my good friend and associate, who was working with the American Center for Law and Justice, uh, told me that, that he's got uh, to knock down fake reports three or four times every day. And the New York Times is just shocking. The so-called liberal media just does everything they can to distort stuff. And, you know, the big thing that uh, when Trump was talking about these uh, MI-13, these, these gangs, he said they're like animals. And instead of saying he was talking about a crime group, he said they put it out that he said that was a case of, of illegal immigrants. He said no such thing. But the, the thing is, they're distorting their words, everything they can possibly do. And it's fake news. It's the Washington Post. It's the New York Times, several other of the liberal organizations. And I'm surprised George Will is supposed to be a fairly responsible person got sucked into this. I don't think the fake news media can understand somebody with the integrity of Mike Pence. They're, they're not That's used to someone in politics being a strong Christian, having values, and honoring. The, he certainly doesn't agree with Trump 100 percent of the time, but he is honoring the office of the presidency, exactly. and they can't figure it out. Well, they just assume anybody in politics is crooked and is godly, because that's the way they, they think like they think, and they're dishonorable to the core. And so, I mean, it's, they, 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 they're, uh, what are they, they're imposing their views on somebody else. But anyhow, uh, we'll, uh, that will get knocked down like all these other fake reports. But it's, it's tough on the president and on the vice president and others to have this constant barrage of, of illegitimate, in, ill-informed uh, press. And as I say, the, the, Jay Sekulow has told me that every day he's got to knock down for Every day. False rumors of what they, they put out there. Mm -hmm. All right, John. Well, Pat, here in Washington, the Senate has confirmed Gina Haspel as the new CIA director. Haspel passed by a vote of 54 to 45, overcoming objections that she presided over a secret CIA site that conducted brutal interrogations after 9-11. Haspel assured Congress she would never allow such a program to be restarted she becomes the first woman to lead the CIA. Pat, this is an incredibly, incredibly important position in our national security now filled. She was highly qualified, and the people in the intelligence agency realized that. Uh, as one person who was an expert has said publicly, she did not conduct those interrogations. Somebody else did. He didn't make, say anything about it, but uh, uh, nevertheless, she, she just sat there very nobly and took the, the heat. But uh, uh, she'll make a great head of the CIA. And for those who think women ought to be uh, involved in political um, uh, work, uh, it's a good thing that a number of Democrats uh, supported her. And uh, that there was a, it wasn't there, a close vote. I mean, she, she was uh, confirmed uh, by a substantial majority. And uh, we're delighted to see that in there. I think she'll make a great head of the CIA. Wendy. It's a good day to be a woman. Yeah. I, Have you ever seen so many women being promoted to high office, and uh, especially under well, the Trump administration? The fact that the, the left would go after her, you know, the, the, they were somewhat embarrassed because they're saying, we're feminists, we want women to be in office. And then here comes one who's highly qualified, and, and they, they kind of had to... You know, yeah. choke and say, all right, we'll support her. All right. Well, from a nose that sniffs out cancer to thriving groves in rocky deserts, new technology advances are saving lives around the world. Coming up, one author tells us who's behind these breakthroughs. So don't go away.
Well, from technology to medicine to agriculture, the little nation of Israel leads the world in advances that make the world a better place. Here's a look at just a few breakthrough innovations that have changed our world. From a device called the Nano Artificial Nose, which sniffs out cancer, to technology that gives sight to the blind and makes the lame walk again, Israel leads the world in medical innovation. Every day, millions around the world use some kind of medical treatment that came from Israel. Israeli entrepreneurs and scientists are also pioneers in agriculture and invented techniques that allowed the tiny nation to turn rocky desert landscapes into lush orchards and mosquito-infested swamps into citrus groves. And Israel has exported these techniques to the rest of the world. In his new book, Thou Shalt Innovate, How Israeli Ingenuity Repairs the World, Author Avi Jorish profiles wondrous innovations that are changing the lives of billions of people around the globe and explores why Israeli innovators of all faiths feel compelled to make the world better. Well, Avi's here with us. He asked me, what is your favorite part of the book? I told him I, I like the part about drip irrigation, but there's so much in here. Uh, imagine a device that sniffs out cancer. Well, he's here with us, Avi Jorish. And uh, thank you for being here with us. Pat, it's a pleasure and an honor. Yeah. Thanks for having me this morning. Tell me, uh, how, how come you, you brought this book out? What, what inspires you? Well, I knew that the Israeli innovations were changing the lives of billions of people when it comes to science, medicine, agriculture. And it's a featured story I knew I needed to tell. What is the secret sauce behind Israeli technology? And I believe it's universities, mm -hmm. diversity, smart government programs, resource scarcity, hyper-resource awareness, mm -hmm. and finally, the prophetic tradition. When you have a prophetic tradition that's 3,000 years old yeah. and instructs you day after day, make the world a better place, cure the sick, help the needy, yeah. help the poor, and you combine that with these driving factors, that's what happens when you, when you, you see the state of Israel. I, I mentioned drip irrigation. That, that uh, Israel is short of water. I mean, the whole Middle East is dry and Africa is dry. Well, what is the secret there? Well, you have, a, first of all, you have a country that is 60% desert, and it is the only country in the world to have declared water independence. Israel is the only country in the world that is independent of its neighbors and of the weather. And it's yeah. done this using drip irrigation, desalination plants, recycling of wastewater. Israel is the world's leader in recycling of wastewater mm -hmm. and dual flushed toilets. And as a result, Israel has more water than it knows what to do with. Come it is on. a water superpower. A water superpower. I, I remember, the world. remember they used to fight over the Jordan River or who got a piece of it? Not anymore. If you look at it, actually, Egypt is going to run out of water in seven years. Jordan is quickly running out of water. Even a country like Iran, in 20 years, 50% of its country's citizens are going to be water refugees. I tend to think as we look into the future, I'm extraordinarily hopeful, even if you just look at water. How did they do the desalinization? What, 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 is that a special process that Israel developed? As it turns out, desalination was innovated right here in the United States, but oh. it was perfected in Israel in the late 1960s. Desalination, of course, takes water from the ocean yeah. and makes it sweet water. As a result of desalination, 80% of the country's needs are taken care of as a result of desalination. As it turns out also, California, we, Israel built the largest desalination plant in the Western Hemisphere right here in California. Israel built it Israel. in California. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, how about the sniffing thing? It sniffs out cancer. What, what's that? Well, you have here a number of devices that are coming out of Israel to really help when it comes to cancer and even saving lives. Take, for example, another wonderful innovation. I don't know if you've seen it. It's a little motorcycle with a back that has a box with medical supplies. Israel has dropped down the time it takes to save a life. An ambicycle can now get, reach a medical emergency within 90 seconds anywhere in Israel. So while an ambulance takes 20 minutes, mm -hmm. you have innovations like an Uber-like device on your phone that pings the five nearest emergency responders along with an ambicycle. 90 seconds is the time it takes to get a medical emergency taken care of in Israel. Incredible. Yeah. Nice. Think, about your, think about your stroke. Yeah. yeah. Had you been even closer, had you been here, it, took, it would have taken 20 minutes for an, for, an, for an ambulance to arrive. And as a result, you had your squad car that came and took you. That's right. If you had been in Israel, the five nearest individuals would have been pinged on their phone to come rushing to save your life and come on a little ambicycle. <laughs> that is absolutely right. And so the people who have strokes in Israel... Do they get treated much faster. They get treated much faster. 
Well, and all of that is featured in the book. If you look at multiple sclerosis, the 2.5 million individuals around the world, yes. two of the top drugs innovated in Israel. Over 50% of those treated with multiple sclerosis are drugs from Israel. Parkinson's, mm -hmm. the methodology to treat a Parkinson's patient was developed, not the method, but the actual, the device that goes in to ping the brain and awaken it again, developed in Israel. It was actually developed by a company named Alpha Omega, which is obviously a reference to the book of Revelations yes, by a Christian Arab Israeli company called Alpha Omega. And their technology is used all over the world here in the United States. For your viewers who have had back surgery recently, they're probably using methodology developed in Israel. And we look at these devices and we look at these innovations. This is the heart and soul of the state yeah. of Israel. Warren Buffett just bought a, a lot of shares in a company called Teva, T-E-V-A, which Parts I understand. A company. Uh, that's a part of, yeah. Uh, what about them? Uh, so Teva produces some of the most incredible drugs on the planet. Take, for example, again, this drug for, um, for multiple sclerosis, yeah. Copaxone, which treats a, a very large number of individuals, comes from Teva. Warren Buffett clearly made a wise investment when he invested in Teva. <laughs> well, I followed along and bought a few shares, too, because I thought it was a good thing. Last thing, the Iron Dome. Um, I was over when they were sending rockets, uh, you know, against Israel in that war that went on. Uh, but that Iron Dome has been very successful. And that was developed, uh, what, in association with America or strictly by Israel? No, it was, it was developed. The R&D happened in Israel. Uh -huh. Think about it. 2012 was the first time in human history that a projectile was knocked out of the sky in such a fashion. Israel did the research and development, but in large part it was funded by Congress. The Iron Dome is a wonderful example of what the collaboration can look like and should like between these two great liberal democracies. And what I want your viewers to take away is when they think of Israel, I don't want them to think of war and aggression. I want them to think of one of the most innovative in the countries that is improving the lives of billions of people. This is a country that is leveraging the prophetic tradition of 3,000 years and basically making the world a better place. Billions of lives are improved as a result of Israeli technology today, both here in the United States and around the world. Of the Bible said so. I mean, they're following biblical truth. Look, you have here the exoskeleton. If you are a paraplegic, yeah. for the first time, you are able to not only walk again, but you're able to run marathons again. The lame shall walk again. Yeah. Israel is using this prophetic tradition for the benefit of humanity. This book, where do they get it? I mean, is it on Amazon? It's, it's, it's sold wherever, it's, you can buy it wherever books are sold. It's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. All right, thou shalt innovate, how about that? And how Israeli ingenuity uh, repairs the world. Thank you so much for being with us. The honor is mine. Thanks, Pat. Fascinating. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you. All right. How about that? View. Thanks, Pat. Well, to celebrate Israel's 70th anniversary, CBN is releasing a brand new documentary called To Life. The exclusive series shows how Israeli volunteers are changing the world. You'll see how teams are delivering medical aid to victims in Nepal, drilling water wells in Africa, helping the victims of terrorist attacks through their trauma and more. This documentary is now on DVD and it's yours for a gift of just $10. So call us 1-800-700-7000 or go to CBN.com and you can share this DVD with friends and family and help us spread the true story of Israel's heroism and help to the nations. Well, coming up, a young wife and new mom gets devastating news from her doctor. At that point, she was stage four. So she had de developed metastases to the lungs and in the brain. I have brain cancer. I thought I'm gonna die. Watch how this woman was healed of terminal brain cancer after this. Ashley Halford was 32 weeks pregnant when she was diagnosed with stage four brain cancer. Suddenly she was facing the possibility of losing her own life and the life of her unborn son. Firefighter Dave Halford and his wife Ashley married in 2004 with dreams of starting a family and building a life together. Their whole world changed one day when Ashley noticed a knot on her neck. Very tiny, and my immediate thought was a lymph node. And I thought, oh great, I'm getting sick. Doctors prescribed antibiotics, which seemed to work, 
But when she got pregnant a month later, the knot returned. He put me on another round of antibiotics. And again, the knot seemed to respond to that. It shrunk back down. But at eight months, when I was eight months pregnant, it grew like violently. It got really big. It also became painful. So her doctor did a biopsy as a precaution. Ashley got a call from her doctor the next day. The very first thing he asked me, he said, is David with you? And instantly, I knew then. He said, it's malignant. But then just a whirlwind of emotions, you know, I, hard to even explain, just everything from anger to fear to disbelief. My wife and my unborn child here this is my whole world. And now suddenly that's just turned upside down. Surgery was scheduled immediately to remove the mass. But first, their son needed to be delivered. Ashley's primary concern was for her unborn baby, especially his underdeveloped lungs. And I, I told her, I said, no, we're not delivering. I said, he's only 32 weeks. And I said, he's not ready. He's way far from ready. And she tried to calm me down and assure me, she said, he has to be delivered. She said, we have to deliver him in order to treat you. Much to the medical staff's surprise, Harley, now 33 weeks old, came into the world not only breathing, but screaming and kicking. I always say that was our first miracle. That was our first prayer answered and the first thing we saw God really do. Harley's birth was a victory, but the Halfords knew they were going to need more than one miracle for his mother to survive. Four days after Harley's birth, Ashley woke up from surgery. She and Dave were relieved to learn that her tumor, now the size of a softball, had been removed successfully. After she recovers, we'll get back to, to normal with the new baby. She can be a mom, you know, thinking everything's going to be okay. My wife's going to be okay. Five weeks later, while at the hospital caring for Harley, who was very sick with a respiratory illness, Ashley began seeing double. Dr. Deborah Miller ordered CT scans and found the cancer had spread. At that point, she was stage four. So she had de de developed metastases to the lungs and along the perineural line up into the cavernous sinus uh, in the brain. This is it. I thought, you know, I have brain cancer. I thought I'm gonna die. And man. Yeah, it, uh, it got bad quick, you know, but I never felt like God left me, but I, I knew this was, this was bad. This is real bad. And all I could do was just, I remember laying in bed crying and praying. And I don't even know what I prayed. I just pleading with God to, to help in this situation. Ashley started a regime of chemotherapy and radiation but her scans showed the tumors growing and multiplying. And the actual report says innumerable tumors present. Dr. Miller then changed Ashley's treatment, but didn't offer much hope for success. Even before we found the metastases, the prognosis was poor. We knew that the chances were this would recur and that at that time, if you recur and you have distant disease, it's terminal. Dave struggled with his faith as he watched his wife suffering. And up until this point, I'd just been just pleading with God. I mean, almost arguing with, I felt like with God, just, you know, please heal Ashley. Please heal her, you know. Please take this cancer away. I can remember having to literally crawl on my hands and knees at my stairs to get to the bathroom or to my bedroom because I could not walk, it hurt so bad. Meanwhile, the Halfords Church started fasting and praying daily for Ashley's healing. I remember praying one day, Lord, whatever your will is, I said, 
that's what I want. So if if it's for Ashley not to make it, I, I prayed that uh, she wouldn't be in a lot of pain. But I remember praying that. And I remember sitting here and I felt like I could literally feel God hugging me. And I never felt that before. I think during that prayer, I think I, that's probably the closest I've ever been to the Lord. Because I could literally feel arms wrap around me. And I remember almost like I could hear him say, it's going to be okay. She's going to be okay. After a month of prayer, Ashley went back in for more scans. And on that scan, I still had all the tumors, but there was some shrinkage on some of them. Some of them had shrunk a little bit. And that was the very first scan that we saw anything positive. Just four months later, Ashley was in remission. Dr. Miller was amazed. Shocked. I mean, ecstatic, but with her prognosis, I was concerned that she would not get a response. Ashley has remained cancer-free since 2009. I had a, an older partner ask me, he says, so you are telling me you cured this young woman of this terminal cancer? I said, no, sir, I'm not telling you that. It was likely divine intervention and then God used us as tools in order to affect her cure. But I said, I'm not so arrogant to think that it was me. <laughs> Fertility specialists told the Halfords that they could never have more children. But Harley prayed anyway. I'd wake up at breakfast, lunch, uh, supper, and before I went to bed, I would say a prayer and I would always pray for sister. Then in February of 2012, Ashley got a call from her doctor about a routine blood test. She says, Ashley, something's wrong with your lab work. And I said, what? She said, it says you're pregnant. After a trouble-free pregnancy, Grace was born. She was joined by Eli five years later. The Halfords say they know firsthand that prayer changes everything. Everyday things, I give it to God, give it to Him, and, and I know from my past experience with the Lord that, that He's gonna take care of things. You know, I don't have to worry about it. But now when somebody says, will you pray for me? I really try to take that to heart because I think back to all the people who prayed for me and the outcome we saw of that and how God answered that prayer, and it really changed how I pray for people. I just love the story. I mean, it's so true. God can do anything, Pat. He can, nothing's too hard yeah. for Him. Here's some good news. that uh, This is Martha. That I caught the end of the 700 Club when the hosts were praying, the audience, and uh, the host, I, I guess it was me, but I don't know who, which one, then called my name and the neck pain I was having and said God was healing me. Immediately I felt a warm sensation in the back of my neck and I was healed, and I thank God for that healing. Wow. Okay. That's from Martha. All right. Praise the Lord. This is from Ann. She says, a few weeks ago, you gave a word of knowledge, Pat, that someone with a Baker's cyst on the right knee was, yeah, right. was being healed. Mm -hmm. uh, she says, I have had surgery, surgery for this type of cyst, and it had grown back larger and more painful. After Pat's word, I reached down, touched my knee. The cyst was gone. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We want to pray for you right now, wherever you are, whatever you, what the problem is. Listen, we're talking about the God who created everything, and He can fix whatever He made, and He made you, He can take care of you. So we're going to join hands. We're going to believe God. Father, Thank you. I join with my sister in Christ, and we pray together right now for the needs that are in this audience. We thank you for miracles that you're doing. Thank you, Lord. Somebody's got serious hair loss. You know, your hair is falling out. What is it, alopecia? The, 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 the hair is... And just touch your scalp in the name of Jesus, and God's going to grow your hair back. 
Yeah. There's someone you were watching the story about Ashley and her terminal cancer, and you have gotten that diagnosis as well. And the Lord is speaking directly to you today that your cancer is not terminal, that a miracle is on, in your future. So just start praising the Lord. Thank you, God. Somebody, you've got a trembling right now. We were talking to them. Israeli author about uh, Parkinson's, and uh, it isn't Parkinson's, but it, it's acting, it's a trembling, and God is, is going to reach down and heal that brain right now, and the trembling tremors are going to stop in the name of Jesus right now. One more. Yeah, there's somebody, you've had like a chronic cough, it just will not go away, but the Lord is touching you right now. Just thank, you. Just thank Him. It's done in Jesus' name. Father, for everyone else in this audience that's praying, we just ask for the anointing of the Holy Spirit come into their lives, touch them, and may your spirit be manifested in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Okay. All right. Well, still ahead, there are a couple who's working less and making more. Hear the secret to their success when we come back. And welcome back to the 700 Club. About 3.2 billion people may never hear a message about Jesus Christ because of where they live. Missions groups call them unreached peoples. And this Sunday, May 20th, Pentecost Sunday, those missions groups are holding an event to raise awareness and to train the church. The International Day for the Unreached is a worldwide Facebook Live event. You can find links to the event at our website. And of course, that's cbnnews.com. Operation Blessing has stepped in to provide medical care for hundreds of people in Haiti's capital, Port-au-Prince. The remote community relies mainly on rainwater as its source of water, leading to many health issues. Operation Blessing sent a medical team to give free exams to more than 700 people, as well as 50 pregnant women. Teams also distributed 25 handheld chlorination units to community leaders and then trained them how to treat their water. You can always learn more about Operation Blessing by going to its website, that is ob.org. Pat and Wendy are back with much more of today's 700 Club. That's coming up right after this. Nolan Cunningham was working around the clock. He still had problems paying bills. Nolan tried to downsize. He tried taking a second job. Still, he was racking up debts. And then he started thinking, well, maybe I should declare bankruptcy until he got a piece of financial wisdom from his dear wife. Nolan Cunningham had a good job working in telecommunications. But in 2004, his company cut overtime and Nolan's income dropped by almost half. We made the mistake of adjusting our living to the income level with the overtime. So when it went away, all the debts incurred by that, just a hard lesson to learn. Nolan took a second job as a security guard working 12-hour shifts on the weekends just to meet their monthly expenses. I was working seven days a week, and so it was exhausting. Nothing but work, wake up, go, come home, eat dinner, go to sleep, do it again tomorrow. I didn't feel like that that was much of a life, but I viewed it as my duty. That's, that's my job, my role. Nolan and his wife, Lisa, also had to deal with medical expenses not covered by insurance for their autistic son, Colin. For two years, they put those bills on their credit cards. We don't know where we're going to get the money. It's, it's just a bad feeling. The Cunninghams cut all extra expenses. When that wasn't enough, they knew they had to downsize. So they put their house up for sale. But with a glut of foreclosed homes on the market, their house didn't sell. We were tens of thousands in debt between student loans, credit cards. By our estimates, we were two months away, probably even one month to be honest, from simply being empty, from having to start deciding who gets paid and who doesn't, and starting to wonder, when do we go for bankruptcy? I keep asking God to help us. Help. During that time, Lisa discovered the 700 Club. There, she heard about tithing and giving. At the time, I wasn't really a giving person. But for some reason, it's like God is drawing me, keeps telling me, you need to do this, you need to do this. So we trusted God. 
the Cunninghams became CBN partners. Two months later, Nolan got a job that came with a $6,000 signing bonus. That saved us, like the immediate need. That job helped the Cunninghams stay solvent. And then, a few months later, Nolan got another offer. The better jobs, the better income, finally moving into some debt reduction. We'd been tithing the whole time, and the blessings just started rolling in. Actually, I write check first to CBN before I write our bills. CBN is special to me because they have a brand in, in the Philippines. They help others so we can help people that are less fortunate. For over a decade, Nolan and Lisa say they've followed God's plan for their finances. Now, they're out of debt, they're earning more, saving more, working less, and getting to enjoy every minute they have with each other. I couldn't be happier that we incorporated tithing as a, just a basic part of our financial management. We directly correlate our blessings with our givings to the church and to CBN, simply because the timing. We started doing the one, we started receiving the other. And so for me, it's, it's not even a question. It's not even a question. You know something? The Bible is so clear about this one. I mean, there's just no question. Give, and it'll be given unto you. Press down, good measure, running over, will men heap into your bosom. Heap into your bosom. Press down, running over, good measure. Give, and it'll be given unto you. That's the law of reciprocity. It's just the way God has set up this world. And if we withhold more than is all, it, it tends only to poverty, the Bible says. But if we give, God says, okay, I'm listening to you. I see what you're doing, and, and you're giving to my work, and I'll give back to you. And Jesus said it. If, if, if it wasn't supposed to be, it wouldn't be in the Bible. It wouldn't be the words of Jesus. I'm not quoting. I didn't make this stuff up. I mean, Jesus said it, and I believe what he said. Now, if you want to participate, like the Cunningham did, you might want to share with CBN. We're reaching out to the world. We're leading people to the Lord, doing all kinds of wonderful things. Um, it's real simple. $20 a month to join the 700 Club. That's 65 cents a day. That's not a whole lot of money. Less than, a, I mean, a sm small percentage of a can of soda pop right now. Uh, 65 cents a day, and you can do it every day, and suddenly it becomes a significant amount of money. And God said, I'll bless you. You, you give, and it'll be given unto you. So if you want to participate, the number's on your screen, 1-800-700-7000. And uh, it's easy to remember. There's a toll-free number. But I really believe that uh, you want to break out of poverty, that's the way to do it. You, you don't get out of poverty by holding on to more than you I mean. You, you pull back. God says, no, go forward and watch what happens. Mm. All right, you Wendy. You can't outgive God. You can't outgive God. You, <laughs> you got it. All right. Well, coming up next, another round of your questions and some honest answers. Lisa says, I divorced my husband 20 years ago. He was verbally and mentally abusive. Am I allowed to remarry or is that a sin? Don't go away. Well, Regent University, we just had a graduation, biggest in history, almost 2,000 graduates. We've got about 25,000 alumni right now. And there are all kinds of exciting things. What is the hottest thing right now is cybersecurity. Everybody wants to get involved. We bought a cyber range. It's the most sophisticated, as far as I know, of any university in America. And it, we have people like the Navy, the Defense Department, the Homeland Security, others are looking into this range so that we can train their employees to, uh, you know, fend, for, I mean, to, to counter cyber attacks, which are just coming, there, there are thousands of them. There are cyber attacks coming from Korea, cyber attacks from China, cyber attacks from Russia, and, uh, cyber attacks within the United States, and we want to be able to counter them. Uh, so if you want to get involved, here's the number for Regent University. It's 1-866-910-7615. Regent University, the world's preeminent Christian university. Okay. Indeed. All right. You ready for some questions? Let's 
Bring it on. <laughs> Here's All right. one from Lisa. She says, Pat, I divorced my husband 20 years ago. I felt I had no choice. He was verbally and mentally abusive and never wanted to talk about our problems. Am I allowed to remarry or is that a sin? You know, the Apostle Paul said, if an unbeliever is pleased to report, depart, let him depart. The brother or sister is not bound in that case. Um, I think, in my opinion, there's such a thing as desertion and there's such a thing as constructive desertion. Mm -hmm. And I think if, if a spouse makes it impossible to live with them because of mental and physical abuse, I think the brother or sister is not bound in that case. At least that's my figure. So you ask, is it okay to get remarried? I would say yes. All right. Amen. When he says, hello, Pat, I listened to the couple that had an infidelity testimony. I'm currently having issues in my 16 year old marriage. My husband is in an affair with someone I know very well. They have a child now. He kept hiding it until I found out recently. I'm heartbroken. My pastor tried to talk to him, but he's not remorseful. He even asked me whether I want to move out. How do I forgive in this situation? He is still seeing the woman. Uh, well, I, I think, how do you just do it if you want to forgive? But at the same time, uh, that marriage is broken and you're looking for a, 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 a cause. Jesus said, except for the cause of adultery and, and so he's committing adultery, has a child, and actually has set up another family. Uh, you, you don't want to live under those circumstances. And can you forgive him? Well, if you want to. I mean, there's no reason not to. It almost sounds you, like she wants to keep the marriage, well, but he's, it's, it's, he's not remorseful. He's not going to keep the marriage, but yeah. she can get out of it, and she can forgive him in your heart. But I, I think to be exposed to that constant abuse and that constant uh, torture is not a good thing. All right. Here's one from Priscilla. She says, I have allowed my adult daughters to borrow items on the condition that if they didn't want them anymore, they would give them back to me. Things such as my deceased mother's cedar chest and a giant oak flower pot. Instead, both items were passed on to other children without asking me if I wanted them back. What should I do? <laughs> <laughs> I think what you should do is write it off and forget it. Uh, you know, why, what are you going to do about it? Are you, are you going to hold them accountable? Are you going to sue them? I mean, you know, it's your child. I mean, she can't. She's the older person in this story. Right. She's not. She can't take that stuff with her. No. She clearly passed it on to her daughter, so then let them pass it on to their daughters. And, it, it, you know. That's right. <laughs> let it go. It's just, it's just a thing, it's and stuff. it's not, you know, something you need to hold on to. All right. Samuel says, if you hold unforgiveness in your heart and won't let go of the past, are you truly saved? Yeah, you're truly saved, but you're not going to get your prayers answered. Jesus said, when you stand praying, if you have all against others, forgive that your heavenly Father might forgive you. If you want to be in a condition of being born again and of being forgiven and having your prayers answered, you have to forgive. Are you saved? Well, you may have come to the Lord, and so I think, yes, that doesn't mean you're not saved, but it means you're not going to have answers to prayer. Mm. We leave you with our power minute from Psalm 20. May he grant you according to your heart's desire and fulfill all your purpose. What a wonderful promise. Thank you all for being with us. We hope you have a great weekend, and next week we'll be talking to you about Ireland, what's going on in that uh, pro-life uh, community. So for Wendy and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. See you Monday. Bye-bye.